Hey guys, Trey Llewellyn here for episode number 10, and I'm super excited to have an amazing guy, actually, with an amazing story on today. It's absolutely amazing to have you, actually, is Dan Caldwell with uh, the, the, the what, what would you want to say, like the previous owner, the creator, the, the, the master of Tap Out? Is that a good yeah. The founder, I guess. The founder. Yeah, and the, co-founder. Co-founder, and we'll, we'll even put it that way. That, that's a good way to put it, actually. So, man, it is, it is a pleasure to have you. It's, uh, it's so cool to have crossed paths with you, and then I appreciate you taking the time to jump on here with us and answer some interesting questions because the story you have is just, I don't know, like not very many people get to have that type of story. So it's, it's, I think it's exciting to like bring that story to life again and let people relive that story. And, and see like how life can be if you, if you put your mind to it and you're, you're so excited and you know what your passion is. But, uh, but anyways, so I want to get into just some real quick stuff. So tell me, tell me how this all started with like how the snow cone business happened and then how we went from snow cones to the UFC. Did I tell you about the snow cone business? <laughs> I, I don't even know where you got that from. <laughs> yeah, that's old. That's really old. Um, so I'd always, I'd always grown up you know, I grew up in a really bad area of San Bernardino, California, which is um, at one time was when I graduated from high school was the murder capital of the United States. It just wasn't a very good area. And I had always aspired to have more. And, you know, I had a really, I mean, I don't want to say I had the worst off because I had the best parents ever mm. and they really brought me up right. I, I, I was brought up going to church and I went to church um, through high school. I went to church every day. And, uh, it was just, it, you know, it was a, it was a good experience in the house, but when we left the house, we'd been in shootouts in front of our house and our cars had been broken into and, uh, lots of drive-by shootings. And so it was, so outside the house, it wasn't quite the same. And, uh, so I'd always just wanted more for my life. I can always remember that. And I always thought about my grandparents owned a machine shop. And so I kind of grew up around this machine shop. They didn't make a lot of money. But I just, I, I, I was always excited about going to the machine shop to, you know, and I just couldn't believe like, this is all, this is all yours. You know, I'd always ask my grandfather, you know, questions about, you know, this is all yours. Like, they're, you know, like this, this room's yours and that room's yours and you can do anything you want. You know, they went to work when they wanted and, you know, it just, it was always interesting to me. And I always thought, you know, I want to do something like that for myself. And I can remember having little, uh, circuses we used to have in our garage where you know you'd build these boxes and you'd have to knock things down and I'd charge all the kids in the neighborhood like a uh, you know like a quarter to play each game or something <laughs> and you know just making little dollars here and there and I remember it adding up and I and and I thought you know I think that experience of being able to make money by bringing people through the door and you know making a few dollars here and a few dollars there I, I enjoyed that experience that transactional experience and, uh, and, and then trying to create something where someone would even want to pay, you know, where they'd even dig out their lunch money to give that to you so that they could come play this game or do whatever you had set up. I remember also doing a magic show in my backyard and going around selling tickets to all the neighbors. And I had a bunch of grownups back there. And, I'd, and I, I don't know if I learned magic so that I could do this show and make money from that or if I just learned magic because I like magic. I still like magic today. So maybe, maybe a little both. And, uh, I, uh, so I just, I just always wanted to have my own business. And I remember ditching school and going to, I drove up to, we live near Big Bear at the South of Big Bear, San Bernardino is right at the uh, base of Big Bear mountain. And, uh, and Big Bear is like big ski area where everybody goes. And I can remember I'd been up there one time visiting and, uh, and when I went into subway, there was this uh, guy, I could tell he was the owner just by the way he carried himself. I was probably a, uh, probably about 15 years old, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I actually, I just started driving and I could tell he was the owner and I'd asked him if he was the owner while I was getting my sandwich. And he said, yeah. And I said, and I just asked him if I could come up and talk to him sometime, you know, is, you know, is there a time I can just come up and talk to him? He goes, anytime, anytime, because I'm here every day. Mm -hmm. And so, cause he had actually lived in Big Bear, although he had owned a few different subways. And uh, I remember ditching high school ditching my class to drive up to uh to big bear to go it's about an hour uh, an hour drive and i'm sorry lake o lake arrowhead and uh, same area but just a different city uh up in the mountains and i drove up to lake arrowhead and i met with him 
And I remember him sitting down with me and talking to me for a while and him telling me how, you know, he, you can't live off one subway. You actually have to own multiple subways to, to make enough money to live because he was only making about $35,000 on one subway, but if wow. he, had, he actually owned five of them. And so because he owned five of them, he could actually make a living. And I just, <laughs> things like that always stuck with me. So I always wanted to be this businessman. I thought, oh, I'm going to start a business. I'm going to grow up and start a business. But then... I had, I had lied about my address to go to a different high school because I wanted to go to a high school that a friend of mine was going to. And my high school was, we were having a lot of, uh, back then the Crips and Bloods were having a lot of issues and uh, there were always shootings and uh, Crips would take over the school or Bloods would take over the school and just have this, they would just knock all the white kids out, you know? So it was like, you were always hiding, you know, as this little kid at the time, you know, I was, <laughs> my God. I was, a, I was a lot smaller. Sorry, I just got done working out, so I'm all sweaty. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, so I always, so I wanted to go to this other school, this Redlands High School, where it was a little more affluent, and uh, that's kind of the rich, where all the rich kids went. So I lied about my address so that I could go to the school my senior year. And uh, my senior year, I took this class um, called law enforcement. And I was also taking an entrepreneurial class, which was kind of interesting because I hmm. didn't have electives like that at my high school. You know, my high school was like wood shop and yeah. metal shop and auto shop, and that's it. Um, <laughs> Air high school, you had this chance to take um, an entrepreneurial class. I took a speech class. I took a, this law enforcement class because I was taking all these electives because I, I was a senior. I didn't need as many classes. Oh, damn. And, um, and I took this law enforcement class, and it was taught by this homicide detective. And I just remember being so intrigued by all the stories she told hmm. that I, I, part of me wanted to be a police officer. So I signed up for the um, Explorers which is like a, a program where kind of yeah. like the Boy Scouts, but you could ride along with law enforcement and you actually wore a uniform, looked just like theirs. So it was, it was like, other than <laughs> having scary. a badge and having a gun, you had a belt on, you had pepper spray, you had <laughs> like, handcuffs, you know, you, I, I looked like a cop. So I, was, <laughs> so I loved it. And I, and I, and you could ride along with these guys. And I can remember, I mean, I remember being like foot pursuits with these guys that they would jump on this guy and I'd jump on the dude and they would like help me get his hands behind his back. You know, I'm a, I'm at, I'm 18 years old and I'm you know, jumping on these guys. Like I'm a police officer. It was, I thought it was the best thing ever. So anyways, I decided at that point I kind of did a career change and I thought, you know what, I'm going to be a police officer. And yeah. I just focused all my time on being a cop. And uh, I put myself through the academy. I'd started saving up money. I was working at Thrifties at the time. Hmm. Uh, and I was a DJ too. So, uh, so I was DJing and I was, and I was, and I was, uh, I was uh, putting myself through the academy. And I was using all my money. I was saving all my money so I could put myself through the academy. After I got out of the academy, I ended up getting hired a, a, as a police officer. And, uh, but, before that time, because let's go back to the snow comb shop, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was also, I was acting as a bouncer at this club. And, uh, and then my entrepreneurial bug kicked in. And this, I realized this club didn't have, um, it was like a rave club or back when they had like these big raves. I think they and, still have those. Yeah. And they would, <laughs> have, they would stuff all these kids inside this warehouse <laughs> And, um, and they'd be raving all night and who knows, they're probably on drugs or I don't know what they were on, but they're all sweating up a storm. And the only thing they could drink was water and Coke. But huh. uh, you know, these kids were all dressed colorfully all the time. And I'm a bouncer, you know, and I'm throwing these kids, I'm putting these guys, these kids heads through doors you know, <laughs> when, they, when they act up. So we'd use them as like battering rams to open the doors up. And it would, uh, uh, but I, but I always remember how colorful they were always dressed. You know, I'm grabbing onto their orange belt and their green shirt, and as I'm taking them out, and I thought, you know what? I bet you these kids, as colorful as they're always dressed and kind of, you know, whatever drugs they're on, they're they they would love snow cones. You know, these like colorful snow cones, <laughs> and and, as, and it was hot as hell. And actually, I was friends with a lot of them because I was. There were a lot of them were all regulars, so they'd always say hi to me, and I was real cool with everybody. And I was, I was kind of pride of myself on being um, the guy that they could talk to when they were about to get thrown out and they're trying to argue their point why they shouldn't get thrown out. Um, and uh, so I, so I thought if I open the snow cone shop in here, maybe we can, um, you know, make a little money on the side besides okay. our bouncing money. Cause that wasn't very good. <laughs> and uh, so they, I talked to the owner and the owner said, uh, you know, well, okay, but I sell a Coke for a dollar. So every Coke I sell, I'm losing a buck. Or every time you sell a snow cone, I'm probably losing a dollar on a, on a, on a Coke. 
So he wanted me to pay him a dollar for every snow cone I sold. So I started to do the math. I was like, shoot, that means I got to probably sell a snow cone for at least three bucks. Yeah. I got to pay him a dollar right off the bat. And then that leaves me two bucks and there's some cost of the snow cone in there. And then I had to hire somebody to work in there. So, uh, so I figured I'm going to sell a snow cone for like three fifty, And, uh, and so we started selling snow cones and, and it did really well. We were killing it right up until he got an air conditioner in the place. <laughs> and, uh, and then it put me out of, it literally put me out of business. I went from having like a line of like 20 kids in line waiting for snow cones all night long to like one kid standing there. It got, he put this huge air conditioner in there. I think it was meant for like a building, like four times the size and it froze the whole place out. The kids were cold. They wouldn't even want to drink snow cones anymore. Oh, dang. Eat snow cones anymore. So how, that how old were you? Started. How old were you when the snow cone business died? Uh, that was probably, I was probably about 19, I think. 19. So your life's over. Yeah. So, well, you know, it was a little business venture. I just <laughs> sold the snow cone machine. You know, I figured it, it paid for itself. I made a little extra money, not a lot, but it was fun. It was fun while it lasted. And I enjoyed the business and we always had like hot girls working in there. So it was, <laughs> it was, it was interesting. So how did you go, how did you do that to, to doing what, what, you know, building this business? Like, cause I know it wasn't tap out at first. It was like in your face, right? In your face. Yeah. Um, we were, so I was a police officer and I, um, right before that, um, I had met, um, my best friend at the time who was a, uh, who we both decided we were going to be cops together. I'd actually talked him into being a cop. He didn't really want to be a cop. And, hmm. uh, and I talked him into being a police officer. And so he got hired on the sheriff's department. I got hired on the police department. And, um, and then we saw the very first UFC in 1993. And we watched this guy, Boyce Gracie, take on these huge dudes. And, you know, he's this little 170 pounder. Uh, he's, he's like six foot, but he's 170 pounds. And he's, he's beating up these these huge dudes, you know, like four in a night, in one night. And part of his technique was taking guys to the ground and submitting them with either a choke or an arm bar or something like that. And this is exactly what law enforcement does. You know, it's exactly what police officers do. And, I, and we just both looked at each other and said, oh, my gosh, we got to learn what this guy does. And he was called jujitsu and you really never, I mean, I'd somewhat heard of it because I remember wanting to be a ninja when I was little, and, <laughs> ninja style. you know, I thought, I thought I was a ninja for sure. And, uh, and so I started to, were you one that, were you wanted to learn that because you wanted to be in the USF, UFC fights or you just no, wanted no, to? No, no, no. It was just, it was purely, I was in law enforcement at the time. I think I was in the academy. I want to say, so I, I, I have to pull back a little bit. I was in the academy at the time when I first saw it. And uh, we watched the very first UFC, this is 1993. And yeah. um, I was in the academy and we saw the very first UFC and I said, you know what, that's exactly what we're learning in the academy. It's, you know, you have to take a suspect down to the ground and then get him into custody somehow, whether you choke him out or, you know, if you're being, if the guy's trying to kill you, lots of times, you know, you watch these videos, Cops was big back then, the TV show Cops. Yeah, I and love you, that. Every single cop show, you know, they tackle this dude they're trying, you know, trying to get him into custody and he's fighting the whole time and, you know, they're screaming at him and they're hitting mm. him with their baton and their forearms <laughs> and whatever. And it just looks so, um, like so many useless blows that you, th you know, and then I watched this guy, Hoyce Gracie come in and just take these guys that are twice as big as he is, you know, by himself and take these guys in down, you know, choke them out or take them into custody somehow they're in his own way, take them in custody. Yeah where, you know, you watch these cop shows and there's like six cops trying to get one dude down and they can't even, they can't even get one guy down. So I thought this is, man, this is uh, we got to learn how to do this. So a week from the, or uh, I think about a week. Yeah. A week from the first UFC, we were training with Hoist Gracie in Torrance, California. We literally stopped watching the show. We went, we had bought a black belt magazine um, the week before and it had talked about the show about oh. the UFC. And it said that Hoist Gracie had a, a, a studio in Torrance, California, which was about an hour and a half away from us. How, how crazy is that? Yeah. That, I mean, that was the luck of the draw. Even though I know there was a few other jujitsu places like in Miami and New York, but um, it was, you know, very lucky to have a place an hour away from us where we'd go train with Hoist, the Hoist Gracie. Yeah. So a week later, we're down, in, we're down there training with Hoist Gracie. It was incredible. It was how, much, how much was he charging to train with? 
it was expensive. I remember being, oh, at least it was expensive for us at the time. It seemed like, sure. um, I want to say it was $80 a class, which seemed really expensive. You know, one class for 80 bucks. Yeah. And this guy was just on TV, right? Yeah. You know, he just fought on, on, you know, on this UFC show, which we'd never even heard of before at the time. It was the very first show it ever come out and his brother had actually created. So Horian was there too. So Horian was, you know, being interviewed during the UFC. So we're, we're training with Horian. Also, um, Hoist is there and Hoist actually taught our first class. Craziest thing. You know, I'm, we we're kind of scared of the guy because we just seen him beat up four dudes. <laughs> and now he's walking through the hallway, you know, and asking us to come in. I literally thought he was going to beat us up. Like the <laughs> class, I thought I watched the show and we're standing out in the, in the lobby and we're watching these, um, private videotapes that they have of them beating people up literally oh, like in the classrooms and stuff like beating people up what i didn't know is those were challenges where people had come into their school and said hey i want to fight you and oh. then they would go into the room and fight each other but to <laughs> me it looked like these guys had come to train and then like he just walked them in there and just start bah! you know just throwing <laughs> elbows on their faces and stuff and you know <laughs> punching them i'm like oh man this is i have my heart when i walked through that door i can remember my heart beating out of my chest. You know, like, have you ever felt your heart beating so oh, yeah. hard? And, like, literally feel it coming out of your chest? I felt like I was about to get in a fight. Like, I didn't know if we were going to go into the door and he was going to, like, just punch <laughs> us in the face or how. But he was the nicest dude. He would get the slowest class you'd ever, I'd ever been in. Because I'd taken Taekwondo before and boxing. I'd been boxing for a long time. So, when I, when I went in there, it was, like, the slowest class. He just, like sat us down and laid you know lay on your back and he was the quietest you know very soft spoken hugged a lot i was i wasn't <laughs> the hug thing this is like before man hug came in yeah. you know, so now we all hug hey what's up bro you know we, all, <laughs> we didn't bro hug back then back then it was kind of it was kind of weird when some guy touched you you were like hey dude you know like hey you know, like, it was full of best hugs. Yeah, now now everybody hugs more, but back then I <laughs> they were they hugged everybody and they hugged a lot and they <laughs> so, uh, it was a little weird for me at first, but I was always scared that that you know it was going to turn tables that first class, but it turned out great and and we signed up that same day. So you start so you start doing that and then and then so then the next UFC fight comes in and so when, how do you start selling shirts on on tables? Well, what happened was um, I, we would go, so we'd go there every Saturday. We could only afford to take one class a week. And um, yeah. so we were going, and plus the drive. So yeah. we'd go every Saturday to take our class. And, uh, and we'd take turns driving down. There's my, me and my friend Charles. Um, and uh, we would, we remember just seeing how many shirts these guys would sell. They had a real basic shirt. It was just a triangle with a circle around it and two literal stick figures like what you would draw a stick figure to look like two stick figures in the middle, like looking like they're about to like do a jujitsu throw or a judo throw. Hmm. And, uh, and they had it just same logo in every color, just every color. I mean, white, green, pink, three different color greens, three different cover browns. You know, it was like just a whole a rainbow of, of different color shirts. And I mean, there would be a line every single day that we went there. Cause sometimes we'd go on privates. We'd go take a private class. Like if we thought we could go down there on a Thursday or something, we'd go take one private class with one of the instructors. And, um, and every single time, I don't care what day you went down there, what time you went down there, there was two or three people in line waiting to get a t-shirt, you know, just standing there purchasing t-shirts. It was like a nonstop thing. And I just thought, you know what, that's kind of crazy. Like these guys sell so many shirts. I wonder if they sell, they make more money selling shirts than they do these classes. Yeah. <laughs> because I know the classes are expensive, but I'm adding it up and they were selling the shirts for 20, I think they were $21 each. Okay. And, and you would just stand there and there it's 21 bucks, 21 bucks, 21 bucks, 21 bucks. That's how fast they were saying, you know, some guy'd walk up four shirts. Okay. Some guy next guy walk up two shirts. Oh, give me two, those two shirts. You know, it's just constant sale. And so me and my friend Charles would have these conversations about, man, these guys sell so many shirts. <laughs> and they would also have these tournaments where different instructors would, as jujitsu started to grow and then more UFCs would come up, you know, you did 
I think, uh, you know, UFC two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I think Hoy stopped competing around five or six. And, and I, and we would, we were going to train at these different or compete in these different jujitsu tournaments, which is jujitsu is full gi. You know, you had a full out, uh, uh, tournament gi on and, uh, and, but when you got there, there were, they would always sell their tournament shirts out in front in the same way. And so we, we just kind of, and the UFC really was kind of lacking color too. So there was no, when the guys would come out, they would just wear whatever they had on. I mean, the guys had sweats on, they had, uh, you know, they'd wear their, their Adidas shorts or whatever they had is what they would end up fighting in, whatever they felt comfortable in. And so at some point we just came up with this idea that what if we created a, a shirt that anybody could wear because it was kind of such, it was, it was, um, it wasn't really accepted that if you trained at the Gracie's, you couldn't really wear some other team shirt like um, sure. Ken Shamrock was big at the time and you couldn't wear a Ken Shamrock shirt if you trained with Hoist Gracie and vice versa. And, you, and, and so these different uh, people were starting to pop up, these different personalities mm. in the UFC and they all had their own shirts. But there was no one shirt that like everybody could wear, except for like Nike or Adidas, the normal clothing that was out there. Yeah. But we thought, what if we created a shirt? Um, and this time, by this time, we're both police officers. Um, he was the deputy sheriff. I was a police officer. We thought, what if we created a shirt that was based around the sport, but um, wasn't, um, wasn't specific to any one training facility? And that's kind of where Tap Out was born. And we thought, you know, let's go sell – we would start off selling at these different jujitsu tournaments and they would charge just, they would let you, um, they'd let you, uh, rent a booth at the, at the tournament. And, uh, and, and that's how, that's how we started basically. So you got this booth. I remember being at one of the booths, uh, there was a tournament called, uh, Clevers and, um, uh, who's the four hour work week dude. Um, Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss is next to us selling a product called brain quicken and we're at these two little tiny tables um of course i didn't know who tim ferris was at the time and he's hey, explaining to us what brain quicken is it was, <laughs> it was a product i guess he invented and i didn't know this until i read his book the four hour work week um but i didn't even know it was him until that point yeah i mean you know i didn't put two and two together but i do remember the conversation because he had actually given us both bottles of of this product that he had created and um and it was just a you know that's how we all started just so, yeah, so, you, did, so you, got the, events. you got the booth going and then so what you just you're just at these booths and doing the ufc so then when did it like when like how much money were you making from the booths uh you know we probably on a good day we were making a couple thousand bucks you know it was, it was just it started off really small because there was there wasn't um yeah remember this is pre real internet commerce yeah. So this is 1999, 98, 99. Yeah. So there was no, there wasn't a lot of internet commerce at the time that was just starting to come about, but we'd built a website, but it was basically just a catalog website. It was like a lookbook. You just went on there and we had the products that we had, but if you wanted to purchase, you had to like call a phone number. So we just had an 800 number at the bottom. And we had talked to this, um, this uh, little martial arts store into drop shipping for us. So they carried all of our product. And so if any calls came in from, we also had a small ad in black belt magazine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so if anybody happened to see our product on here's, here's how, here's how hard a, you know, it was for us to get a sale at the time to get a commerce sale. You had to have seen the UFC to kind of know who we were. And then if you did see the UFC, you had to buy a black belt magazine to know what our website would be. <laughs> and, then, um, and then if you saw the little tiny ad that we had in black belt magazine, that was just basically our logo. And it said an expression of combat. And then it said in your face.com. Cause we didn't own the tap out.com at the, at the time. Yeah. So if you saw that, then maybe you went to the website if you owned a computer and if you knew how to get online, you went to the website on your dial up, and, uh, and then you happen to see our website with the shirts and then hopefully you decided to call if you trusted the internet at that time, because a lot of people didn't even trust the internet. And then if you called, um, you could, you could make a purchase uh, over the phone. Um, if the 
the store happened to be open at the time that you called and they could actually take the order. So it was, you know, it was hard getting commerce sales back then, but it started to grow. And I think about 19 or uh, 2000, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, 1999, um, we embedded our first uh, shopping cart where you could actually do oh, cool. sale online. But it was, um, I can remember our sales, they would come over in email form, you know, oh. so you get like this email that said yeah. you'd made a sale. And then you would have to, you know, we were shipping credit. It was the shopping cart would send you their credit card info over this email. Oh, and then you'd have to get your little terminal and type in the <laughs> information, you know. So you actually really didn't actually do the transaction online like we do now. Yeah. It was done later after you got all the information and put the credit card through. So every once in a while you'd get a credit card that wouldn't go through and you'd have to call the person and say, hey, you know, we tried to put your card through. It didn't go through. Fat fingered it. Yeah, so, so we took, so we took it back that? over in 1999 and started doing our own drop shipping and started to try to build, really build the company because we felt like we were lacking. We wanted to create 20. We, we, I think it was really important for us in 1999 to create um, trustworthy commerce online because a lot of people didn't trust. Nobody wanted to put their credit card number on online at the time mm -hmm. it was all these horror stories about how people take your credit card and go you know sure. on a shopping spree or something so we wanted to create this really trustworthy commerce online and um we we always included our phone number too really big in fact we always thought we'd get more phone calls than we did internet sales and we did at the time it was kind of like a lot of people like to call so hmm. i would walk around with um myself so when i was working i'd be on patrol and I, cause I was still a police officer at the time and I would have my cell phone and I would have the phone number forwarded to my cell phone and I would keep a, um, order forms in my back pocket so that if I got a call while I was on duty, I could take the call, you know, I'd tap out clothing and, um, <laughs> go, oh, I'd like to order some shirts and I would like turn down my police radio <laughs> and then, and I would, I would pull out the little order form and get my pen out. And I would t literally take the order right there on, uh, you know, over the phone. And, uh, and then if I missed a call, I can remember some, at some point, like maybe in 2000, um, I said it so that if I, so it had like a double forwarding. It forwarded from my home 800 mm -hmm. number, which was our separate line that was an 800 number for our, um, orders. And then um, it would forward to my cell phone if I left the house. And then if for some reason I missed the call, it went to an answering service that um, would take the call. But it was so expensive for an answering service to take the call. You know, it, was, it turned out to be like a $4 phone call um, that um, I tried not to let it go because, you know, it, it really killed the, how much you make on a sale. You know, you sell a shirt for, you sold one shirt for 10 bucks um, or for 20 bucks. We only had about. I think we were paying like $10 per shirt at the time because we didn't have a good, we couldn't print enough shirts to actually get the cost down. So um, we were paying like 10 bucks. So if you paid 10 bucks, if you sold one shirt, it was 10 bucks plus the $4 phone call. So yeah. you only ended up making like six bucks on the sale, you know? So it was like, we wanted to make sure we always answered that phone call if we could. How many, how many sales were coming in a day or a month? Um, I can remember our first year on uh, the first year on record in 1999, we did about $30,000 in sales and That's pretty good then. From uh, I mean, it was okay for t-shirts, you know, do you have to sell a lot of t-shirts to sell $30,000? Uh, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. So how did people, like you said, people knew like they'd have to go to the UFC, see you on UFC. How were they seeing you, you on UFC and then have to go to black belt? Like were you, well, it was just, it was a coincidence, you know, that was our only way of really getting the, the word out there. So if, um, if, you didn't end up at a, at a jujitsu event or you didn't watch the UFC or you didn't happen to buy a black belt with our little tiny ad in there. There was no way to really find us. You know, okay. it was like, you know, there was no Google at the time. So there's, you know, it was pretty hard to find somebody at that time unless you knew their exact address online. Yeah. So, and we had a weird address. We didn't really think about some of these things through when we, when we did it, but it was in your face.com. <laughs> Because we didn't own tapout.com, we thought, oh, let's do something kind of hard, you know, that meant something, that kind of stood for something. We were like, uh, in your face, I-N-Y-A-F-A-C-E. You even had to know how to spell that. What if, you know, what if you thought it was in your face or mm -hmm. in you are face? You know, it could have been anything. So it was, it, it, we didn't think that through at the time, but we thought, I mean, but having that ad where people could actually see the word written out, 
And then when we'd go to all these tournaments, we would print out these flyers that were kind of like, um, they were decent ads. You know, I mean, now I look back at them and kind of like, you know, scuff, but it's a, uh, it, it pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, we had, the, I remember this one ad, it was a little card we had and we'd got this guy. He was a fighter from, um, uh, gosh, he was like from Louisiana or somewhere. I can't remember, but he was like our, one of our first sponsored fighters that were outside the UFC. Cause we started to sponsor fighters in the UFC, but he wasn't, he wasn't like a, he was fighting in some of the smaller events that were around the country. And, um, his name was Bo. I can't remember his last name, but his name was Bo. And I remember we got him to put his face down on these train tracks and we like stepped on his face with a, a boot <laughs> and, and, and we turned it and that we took a picture, like a close up picture of that where you could just see his face all smushed and, you know, kind of like this and, 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 and they just said tap out above it. And it was just this boot sitting on this guy's face and it said in your face.com. <laughs> that was our first flyer so we'd go around and pass that around to people and uh and i think we might have had a few shirts on the back that they could see and as a go for, for you know for more shirts go to inyourface.com to see our catalog and uh and that's that's kind of how we got the word out there i would start flying around the all you know the country um selling at these little tiny events and we call it like dropping hand grenades we we're just putting little hand grenades everywhere yeah to get the word out there so people knew who we were. We'd fly to um, Louisiana and do a show there. I remember that I'd never been on airplane before. I was uh, 26 years old at the time. Hmm. And I, my very first flight ever was white knuckling it over to Hawaii for oh, uh, a, a Super Brawl event. I'd never been on a plane ever in my life. I grew up poor. We didn't have, you know, our vacation was like camping in a tent at the beach. That was, that was a vacation for us. So I'd never been anywhere or been on a plane or gone anywhere in my life. So being on this plane for the first time, um, you know, flying out, I, it was like a sacrifice for me. Yeah. You don't understand. Like I was, my heart was pounding out of my chest. I did not want to get on this airplane to save my life. I, I, I had a firm belief that we should not be flying if we had, we were born with wings maybe, but other than that, there's no reason that we should be in the air with this big hunk of metal. So, so uh, was Bo your first uh, your first sponsored fire then? Um, no, no. Actually, I think you know we had some we had some jujitsu guys at the time. We were sponsoring this guy um, Javier Vasquez, and you know they were jujitsu guys, so they were all you know um, geese on. But I think our really first sp uh, sponsored fighter was Jeremy Horn and mm -hmm. uh, and Pat Militich. They fought in the UFC and UFC eighteen or UFC Brazil actually. Um, where they had both fought. Pat Miletic won the won the belt, and uh, actually Jeremy Horn lost to Vandalay Silva that night. So on that, so like when you when you say sponsor, like like was that a lot of money to sponsor these guys? We just tossed them gear, and you're like, hey, no, you're no, no. Well, you know, we tried to do gear, but gear didn't mean a lot if your brand didn't mean too much. You know, brand wasn't really anything. You know, it's like you can hand. You, you know, I'm sure. Um, you know, as you're starting, I'm sure you started brands before and you know, when you hand somebody a shirt and they never heard of the brand before, it doesn't really mean a lot to them. So we were a new brand at the time. We're trying to make a name for ourselves until we really started to place heavily in the UFC, which was about money. Mm -hmm. um, it was hard to get people to wear your shirts other than they had a cool word on there that had to do with the sport that they liked. And I think the name helped a lot, even though people didn't like the name at first, when we first came up with the name. They didn't really like the name because they thought it meant you lost, you know, like you tapped out, oh, you know, yeah. lost. So everybody goes, oh, now everybody goes, oh man, what a great name, right? That's why you guys were successful because you had the best name in the business. And uh, we just, you know, what are you going to say? Because the you know, <laughs> truth was everybody hated the name when we first started. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So I want to get, I want to get like into some deep stuff about tap out. So tell me about like your, I think the biggest thing that came which was you're, you start sponsoring these guys and then some billionaires come in and, and say, we want to, we want to invest in the UFC. Right. And that's yeah. kind of where I think his name was, um, uh, Francisco or something. Fertitas. Yeah. It's, Fertitas. Uh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Lorenzo and Frank Fertitas. So they're the billionaires that, um, that own, uh, some, um, casinos in Vegas. 
And uh, in 2001, well, the UFC had always had a lot of trouble. So everybody thinks, too, that we also got in the UFC when, oh, you guys saw it blowing up, so you jumped in. No, literally, it was in its worst state that the UFC had ever been in. Um, John McCain was hating on it. He was calling it human cockfighting. <laughs> and um, it was it, it literally at that time, it, had been, it was only legal in three states at that time. And it was taken off like every cable show. It was barely hanging on. Um, I think pay-per-view was let, barely letting it on. It was only legal in like Denver. Um, mm. it, and so there, they were, it was hard to put, they were trying to put on shows outside the United States. They were just trying to figure that out. And um, uh, the, the guys that owned it, I think it was Bob Merowitz, um, had, was trying to figure out how to sell it. And he found some buyers in uh, Lorenzo and Frank Fertitta. And Dana White had actually, who, you know, is the president of UFC, now the president of UFC, was the president of UFC. Um, he had came to them. I guess they were childhood friends. And um, Dana and Lorenzo were all training at a guy named John Lewis's school in, in Vegas. And John Lewis had fought at, a, at an event that was really similar to the UFC, but it was kind of a copycat event that was on television. And he had fought one of the Gracies, um, a different Gracie, um, on that show to a draw, which is, you know, it's like at that time, Gracie's were like held on these pedestals. And when you had one of the best uh, Gracie's in the country or in the world come in and fight this unknown John Lewis, who nobody really knew, but he was actually training with um, a, a, an elite jujitsu guy too from Brazil. So he had already, he'd been training for a long time with this jujitsu guy. So people, even though we didn't know his name, we didn't know that John was actually a really good player already. Hmm. And, um, but when he fought to draw, John had a big name, it became a big player. And, yeah. and, um, and going back just to back a little bit, our very first tournament, John Lewis was the very first person to buy a shirt from us ever. Wow. So the very first tournament we ever sold at, we were sat there in this little tiny YMCA. I don't know if you guys have YMCAs, but yeah. little tiny YMCA. And it had two mats where they were having this jujitsu tournament. Alan Wrench was throwing this uh, judo jujitsu tournament. And um, we had a little tiny table. It was uh, actually a video of it. A little tiny, tiny table. Probably like two and a half by, two and a half by three feet. And we had like four shirts set up on it. And we sat there forever. I was competing. Uh, Charles was sitting at the booth selling. And, um, and we sat there forever not selling one shirt. Like probably, well, not forever, but, you know, the first quarter way through the, sh through the show or through the day's tournament, the one-day tournament, and hadn't sold one shirt. And John Lewis, who was – everybody knew who he was in the place because he had brought his, his guys because he was an instructor, brought his guys there. John Lewis decided to come over and look at our shirts and he actually bought a shirt and put it on. Oh wow. And boom, it just changed the whole look of the room. Every time it all of a sudden all these people came up and started buying shirts. And I think we sold that cause we didn't have a ton of shirts there. We didn't have a lot of money to buy shirts. So sure. we had only bought a few. Um, I think we had like, you know, 12 of, we have four different styles, like 12 of each style. And we literally sold out of every shirt that by the end of the day. So it's that nice. was, uh, so that's John Lewis. And then now, fast forward, um, he's in Vegas, and uh, he's teaching his school out there, and Lorenzo and Frank and Dana are all training with him, and that's how they learned about the UFC, and Dana had brought to them, hey, look, the UFC's for sale, guys. You guys have the money. I think we could probably steal this thing, and just the IP alone with the, all the videos that are out there and everything, you know, it might be worth some money. And if we can really get the show going um, again and get it legal, who these guys, I guess, were – Lorenzo was sitting on the board of the Athletic Commission in Vegas, mm. which it, they thought, look, you're on the Athletic Commission. You know everybody on the Athletic Commission. If you could step off the board so that there's no conflict of interest and then, you know, lobby your friends into legalizing the UFC in Vegas, game over. I mean, you – game over. You have a company now that's worth bank. And um, I'm thinking that's I'm talking like them. That's the mindset that they had, I believe. Yeah. And, uh, and they did. And that's what they did. They bought the UFC for two million bucks and turned it into this multi-billion-dollar company. They ended up selling uh, a couple years uh, last year, year ago, two years ago. So let's. I want to talk about like why why uh, tap out became like I want to kind of get into. So where I'm trying to head this, where is is like where you're sitting in the stands a week before a big fight and you look down and there's something 
on the mats that you've never seen before, what that, what that experience was, and then what that created as it went live? Um, well, up until 2001, we had only had fighters wearing tap out in the UFC. And I can remember uh, Lorenzo, you know, because we, had, we had actually had our first meeting with him in, on September 11th, 2001. Mm. So um, we got up that morning to drive to Vegas because it's about a four-hour drive to Vegas. And um, when I get up in the morning, I turn on the news and, you know, they're having this whole incident thing go down in, in New York. And I'm like, holy shit, like, this is crazy. You know, at that time, you know, we thought the world was at war. You know, we didn't know what was going on. And uh, I remember we called Lorenzo and asked him, hey, you know, we have a meeting set today at like 2 o'clock. You, you know, and it's like 6, 7, 7 in the morning or whatever it was. And um, uh, this West Coast time. And he said, do you still want to meet? And he's like, sure, you know, we got this meeting set up. We can monitor what's going on. And short of, you know, Vegas getting attacked, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll have this meeting. And uh, I just remember listening to the news all the way down there because it's about a four-hour drive. And we drove this um, old van that we had. We had pay- By this time, we had had uh, two vans. We had painted these vans all black. And, uh, <laughs> and it wasn't like we were making a ton of money. We would bought these vans for like $1,000 at the salvage auction. And – um, painted them all black and then um, and then took these big vinyl t- stickers and put huge tap out logos on them and uh, they were just they, they were you know it was kind of like we felt like we preempted that black on black thing because we had black rims and black but <laughs> black rims were just because there were these steel black rims you could buy and and it made the van look ca- kind of hard so uh, we drove this one one of our vans down there lucky to even make it to Vegas you know it was a scary thing even driving it there we're just praying the whole time we had this important meeting we're praying that we're even going to make it to Vegas and uh we made this uh kind of big award for them made out of glass we were we had this friend who made this stuff blue like blows glass and does all these great glass sculptures so we had paid like $2,500 which was a ton of money for us oh, damn. Um, um to make this huge four foot tall glass sculpture that said UFC with um, cage behind it, like a cage out print or print. And, uh, and then like this tap out displaced them uh, over it or next to it with, you know, using these like metal rods and stuff where it was all holding it all together. It was a really cool thing. They kept it in their lobby for years, but uh, we were presenting them with that at our meeting. And so we went to our meeting. We had a really good meeting. They always told us, you know, you guys will always be part of this UFC. So the very first UFC after that meeting, um, it was back east somewhere. I'm going to say it was at Mohegan Sun in, uh, uh, in Connecticut. And they walk us out to, to the area before – they walked us into the arena before uh, – I think it was – I don't know if it was that morning. might have been that morning. And uh, – we walk out there and our tap out logos are on the mat. Like Damn. you don't even understand. <laughs> no. Like you don't understand. Like that is <laughs> because they had tried to, and I understand why now um, they were trying to create this, um, this, uh, you know, this need for, for advertising, for marketing on the UFC ring, which, um, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, if you have a NASCAR, and you're just jumping into the sport and you don't have any sponsors, well, shoot, why not stick tied on the front, you know, on your, on your hood to yeah. draw in other sponsors? And you're like, Oh, how much is tied paying? Oh, they were paying $4 million. How much <laughs> you want to pay? You know, <laughs> we weren't paying anything. We didn't pay anything for it. They just literally gave it to us. And I, you know, I mean, it obviously brought in other sponsors, you know, they're like, Oh, we got these sponsors and they, well, here's the thing is they own Gordon and beer spear company. Mm-hmm. And, so they stick Gordon Biersch on there and they stick tap out on there. And I, I can't remember who else was on there, but um, you know, Oh, the Mohegan sun was on there. Um, the casino that we were at in, the, in uh, Connecticut. And so those were the only sponsors, but they were all free sponsors. You know, all people that they were just, you know, nobody had paid probably I'm guessing. So, so that goes live on TV. What happens, what happens to your online store? 
Well, at that time, you know, it started to do, you know, we obviously every year we're doing 300% growth. So, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, um, you know, we're doing I think our first year we did 30,000, then we do 300,000, then we do 900,000 and we're doing, you know, 1.4 million, you know, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And, um, it just, it continued to explode, but in where it really changed, where everything changed, life changed. Um, in 2005, six, um, the UFC decided to do an ultimate fighter TV show on spike mm. and Spike was relatively a, a new channel. They really didn't know what spike was. Uh, I mean, nobody really knew who spike was. They really, they only had Joe Rogan's show that was called The Man Show. It was the only like kind of big show that people would uh, go looking for and it happened to be on Spike TV. Well, somehow there was a connection there. They were friends with Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan was an announcer for the UFC and you know they put all this together um, to do this television show, that, a reality show on Spike t- t- uh, television. And we heard about it. So we were like, we had like drove down to Vegas during the filming of the show and we would go in the middle of the night and we would stuff tap out shirts inside of, we knew where they were filming and they had those little mail slots on the door, you know? And so we'd go and stuff like 40 <laughs> tap out shirts through these mail <laughs> slots. I, I remember being so scared that a cop was going to pull up and just, there's nothing else here in this industrial park. They're literally going to think we're breaking in. There's no other way to look at it. We're breaking into this place is what it looks like. Because you got two guys in the middle of the night with this black van, <laughs> you know, and we're pulled up up to the front doors of this industrial complex area. And there's only other industrial places there. And we're stuffing T-shirts through the front door of the shirt of this place. Luckily, no cops ever pulled up. But um, And then we were staying with Chuck Liddell. Chuck Liddell had let us stay in his place, his, his apartment that they had um, rented for him. And... Um, and, and we were just trying to get our shirts on Chuck and trying to get our shirts inside the show. And then when the, sh- the finale, so we did get some of our shirts in the filming. The producers to this day don't believe that we ever had shirts in that show. But if you watch the very first season of The Ultimate Fighter, you can see we got tap out shirts in there. Obviously, different fighters picked them up and decided to wear them. They didn't have real control of that, you know, understanding yeah. that, you know, that, you know, license, you know, the sponsorships and different things. So they weren't really controlling it as good as they thought. They thought that no tap out was in there, but we had tap out in there and uh, <laughs> Chuck was wearing tap out a few times. And so it was, it was pretty cool. And actually we had a couple of fighters fighting tap out shorts. Chuck had given them to his guys. He was, Chuck was honestly one of our just really, um, he helped us out a lot during our journey of building hmm. the brand. And, um, so uh, during the so the finale comes the very you know the finale for the for the Ultimate Fighter these two guys who had fought through the house undefeated were going to fight each other on this live show uh, that that was coming up and so the UFC we didn't have they wanted to know if we could sponsor the event and we didn't have a lot of money so you know an event on television where all these people are going to be watching this finale you would expect would cost a million dollars or something like that. Well, they, you know, they just were being generous when they came to us and said, Hey, look, you know, what can you guys pay? Just tell me what you can pay. I'm like, we can't afford it. <laughs> you know, we can't afford it. I'm telling you, I know, you know, my head, the numbers says a hundred thousand is like the least they'll take. And we're doing okay. This is 2006. We're doing okay. But we're still robbing Peter to pay Paul. We're totally self-capitalized. We got no, mm-hmm. even though we're making um, uh, a few million bucks probably, or a couple, a couple million bucks maybe at the time, um, we, we're, we don't, I mean, money is coming in the door and it's going out the door. I'm yeah. living in a condo in Grand Terrace. <laughs> I don't, we don't have any money. We're barely paying our bills. And, uh, but mm-hmm. yet, um, they just ask us, you know, so there, I got to think that they think that we have money. Mm-hmm. So they ask us, you know, what can you guys afford? And I said, I, I don't, I'm just telling you, I don't even want to give you a number cause I don't want to, I don't want to insult you. Like, <laughs> I can't afford it. And she goes, I can remember them um, saying, well, Lorenzo said, whatever you say you can afford, we'll take. 
And I was like, we can maybe afford 5,000 bucks. <laughs> and, uh, and they said, okay, fine, whatever you say. And I said, and then I said, you know, but I don't have the cash. Can we like pay you in shirts? <laughs> so they, they let us sell the shirts in the arena and use that money we, we sold the shirts for to pay for our, our logo on the, on the map. Oh, and wow. then I didn't even know this at the time, but during the event, which turned out to be huge on television, I mean, huge for, for, for Spike TV. Um, during the event, they actually put our logo up on them. You know how like at the end of an, uh, in between, like um, they'll say, hey, this event, this event's been brought to you by, you know, Budweiser. And this event's been brought to you by Hilton Hotels. And well, then Tap Out pops up. You, you know your your place for for fight clothing it, go to inyourface.com <laughs> oh my gosh so we're sitting i'm we're sitting front row next to chuck liddell and i hear dana white come back to chuck during the event and i'm talking probably still today one of the best fights in ufc history this is bonner versus forrest griffin mm -hmm. i mean one of the best fights in UFC history still maybe partly because it's credited for blowing up the UFC and really making the UFC what it is today, but along with Chuck Liddell. Um, but this event turned out to be huge for the UFC because at one point, I guess Dana White comes back to Chuck and he goes, I can hear him talking, whispering to Chuck and Chuck leans over and says, 10 million people are watching the show right now. Whoa. Somehow Dana got numbers on the spot, you know, from them. And, and it was just crazy. 10 and million get out of the event. Um, we're jumping in the car. I can still remember we're walking out of the event. It was at the UNLV, uh, an event center at the U uh, university of Las Vegas. And we're getting into our truck and our big tap out truck. We had a suburban by that time. And it was big old tap out logos on it. It was big black lifted suburban with all black rims, everything. And, uh, and I get a call from my web guy who literally says, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and our site had like blown up. And he goes, dude, you're getting 3,000 orders an hour right now. Holy jeez. I said, what? <laughs> like, you got to understand, we were like getting, you know, we get, you know, at that time we were probably doing a few orders an hour during targeted times. Uh -huh. This is 11 o'clock at night or 12 o'clock at night or something. We're doing 3,000 orders an hour. And I could not, I mean, we, we started trying to figure out, he goes, dude, your whole system's crashing right now. I'm doing everything I can to keep it up. But <laughs> Poor IT guy. We, had, we just had credit card processing. But <laughs> here's the bad thing. We didn't have any, um, at that time, most shopping carts didn't have a, um, a, an inventory back-in system. So... Uh -huh. If you sold something, it wasn't because it knew you had it in inventory. If you had it up and available, it, it was available. Mm -hmm. And um, so we sold a lot of shit that wasn't available because we did, you know, we, we had like four in the warehouse, you know, like four of this size and <laughs> we just sold, you know, 150 of them. <laughs> you know, it's like huh. we had four medium gray tap out shirts, but we just sold 400 of them <laughs> you know it's like it was crazy and he says all i can do is capture the credit cards now because we can't process them your processor is not working fast enough so we have to shut that whole back end down we're gonna have to capture the credit cards so that you can take orders because he says it's it's creating a you know i don't know all this stuff but it's creating a bottleneck and um it's it's making orders it's turning orders away it's not yeah. letting them process yeah because it's not being able to process the orders fast enough. So to be able to take in all the orders, so you stop losing orders, um, we're going to just capture the credit card numbers and you're going to have to manually process all these fools <laughs> at, you know, later down the road, which actually turned out to be a blessing because um, the ones that we did process turned out, you know, it, it took us like three months to get caught up with all these orders that had come through on this night or Gee. the, over the next week or two um and and so the ones that didn't get processed were actually a blessing because not to, to just have their credit card and go and be able to call them and say look we haven't charged you but as soon as your products come in because we got bombarded that night 
as soon as we get the products in, we'll charge you and send your products out. That helped. The ones that were charged were a bunch of pissed off customers. Oh yeah. That had charged already and didn't have their stuff in, you know, so we like, we maybe had two things in and we'd like send them their two things and then we ship when we had the two oh, other things that they ordered that came in. Oh, I owe you no. Know. So that, so that was a big change for you. So, so the same, so in 2006, you also sold a percentage of the company off. Yeah. Um, 2000, that might've been 2007, somewhere in there, 2006, there. seven it was right around there. Um, yeah, we sold a, a, sold a little piece of the company. We, we needed money to grow. We were like, it was out of control. We really tried to be self capitalized. It, it's really hard maintaining inventory, especially when you have, you know, you have to buy a bunch of product and then mm -hmm. sell the product and use that money to go back and buy more. It just, you don't realize how hard that process, I couldn't understand why we were so poor. You know, you'd look at the numbers and go, I, I just don't get it. Well, what I, what I didn't understand was we had hundreds of thousands of dollars of inventory. You know, that's where all of our money was. You and go. you had to keep that much inventory to continue to process those number of orders. And we had no money in our pocket. It was all in inventory. It was like we had invested. And I, that feeling of I have tons of inventory. When am I ever going to be able to pull money out and stick it in my pocket? Well, at that growth pattern, never. You know, if, as long as you continue to grow at that level and at that speed, you're never going to be able to put money in your own pocket. So we had to create, um, you know, some sort of uh, something in there uh, where we could finance our orders and, and we figured that out through bringing in an investor and that helped a lot. And we took a lot of money off the table right away. So it was the first time I'd ever got a million dollars sitting in my account. I'd never seen that before. I woke up one day. I mean, I didn't wake up. I'm sorry. I never went to sleep. But, you know, I you know, you looked at your, yeah, I think we left their office and I remember just continually calling my bank, listening for my, because back then you didn't really have internet stuff, you know, you weren't really able to jump online or if you were, I didn't have that. Um, so you'd call your bank and ask for your bank balance. <laughs> and so I was calling, I was like, what's my bank balance? Oh, 42 bucks. Okay. never mind. I'll call you right back. So I'd wait, you know, and I wait and I, and then I, okay, let's call again. I call back and what's your bank balance? 42 bucks. Okay. never mind. Never mind. And I call back. And I call back and go, what's your bank balance? One million forty two dollars. <laughs> and I was like, oh shit. Oh shit. Something and, finally uh, happened. I think I called like four more times so I could just, so, so just so the person, that, you know, the operator on the phone could go, $1,042,000. I go, really? Are you sure? Did you check it again? Yes, $1,042,000. Okay, are you sure? That's in my account. Yes, $1,042,000. Okay, thank you. And then you're like, we made it. We made yeah. it. What did, you do? what did you do with the money right after you got it? Stupid stuff. Really stupid shit. I just, um, I think the very first, th well, the very first thing I did, well, yeah, I mean, you know, I did some good stuff too. I, I bought my parents, my, we lived in a really, really bad neighborhood. By then, the neighborhood was really, really going downhill. My, um, I can remember my mom got mugged in front of our house, like right at our doorstep. She got tackled and her purse ripped out of her hand. And it was, uh, you know, by then there were shootings all the time. And, and I had moved out. So I'd moved into a little bit nicer area of, of the city and we're outside the city in a neighboring city. And, uh, and I just, I remember telling my parents, you got to get out of that house. And so, um, I, uh, I, uh, I bought them a new car. Um, they'd never owned a new car in their life. And so I surprised them one day I had them come over. Uh, actually I was at their house and I had, I had had my parents buy them a new car. I mean, I had my brother buy them a car. I go find them a nice Lexus. And, uh, so, um, he, he, he drove up in the car and they're like, I was like, Oh, Damon, and we had this little skit planned out where he would pull <laughs> up in the car as we, as I had brought him outside. And, uh, and they're like, hello, hey, D you know, they're like, what's Damon driving a new car for? <laughs> and then he just walked up and handed them the keys to their new Lexus. It was the best. And then um, it was right before Christmas, my mom got mugged. So this is like the same year, but it was the back half of the year. And because um, I'm ashamed to say what the first thing I bought, which was a Lamborghini for myself. Right. But, uh, 
The second thing I bought was a car for my parents. I bought a, a Cadillac for my grandmother. I remember calling, she lives in Texas, in San Antonio. And I remember calling her, um, the uh, uh, Cadillac dealership out there and going, look, I see you have a Cadillac and I add, I'll pay your sticker price for that. I don't want to, I'm not going to try to jog you down at all. I'll pay you exactly what your sticker price is, but you have to promise me you'll go videotape the delivery of this with two dozen flowers. And, uh, and so they said, okay, absolutely. We'll do it. <laughs> well, he said he had to jump off phone, ask his manager and he came back and said, okay, you have yourself a deal. So I wired them the money for the Cadillac and they drove up a brand new Cadillac to my grandmother's house. And, um, with uh, two dozen roses and filmed the whole thing. So I still have that on video, which is awesome. That's cool. And, um, and, who, and I credit my grandmother because she did, um, at one point, I remember she given us, she gave us a little bit of money to go out and buy a, a, a sales trailer. Mm. Um, I didn't, I, we couldn't figure out where we were going to get the money. We knew that the sales trailer could really help us out a lot because there were some events that were being held outside. And so she gave me the money to go. It was like $5,000. And she gave me the money to go buy that trailer, which, you know, was awesome and I always remember that and I always said I said grandma I've been telling her since I was little that one day I was going to buy her a new Cadillac and uh and so oh, I was able true. to fulfill that promise and then uh that Christmas my mom got mugged in like uh, September or October and um and so I started looking for a house for them a new house and they found this beautiful house up on top of this hill it never been lived in um it kind of like it uh it, it, all the houses around it had been bought and it was the only one story house that hadn't been purchased yet and it overlooks the whole valley and beautiful area, super nice area with security and that it doesn't even need security because it's just brand new houses. And, um, I, I, I told them that we were going to like this Christmas event and, uh, and I got them to the house and, and as we got to the door, I, uh, whew, I get choked up just talking about it. Um, as we got to the door, I had had the whole place decorated professionally by a, oh, by a, a decorator. So it looked like a model home. So I got, I, I pull out the keys and I open the door and they're like, weird. Like, why are you opening up the door to get in? And <laughs> I open the door and all, it's, it's all totally furnished and brand new furniture and it looks beautiful because it looks like the model home, you know, in the neighborhood. Uh -huh. And, um, and they walked in. I just said, this is, you know, here's the keys to your new house. Wow. So holy smokes. So real quick, million dollars in a couple cars, a house. And then, and then tax guy says he owes some money from, uh, from really, because I think I think the biggest thing that that people who go from entrepreneurial to success, um, they go from the the mindset of the government owes me money, to, yeah. to now oh it's actually a good thing to be paying checks to be yeah, paying. and because that yeah. means you're making money yeah, right? and that's a big that's a big falsehood uh, that the that the public has in their eyes where it's like oh it's tax season wait I get money back I'm like no that's no what that. But for you, like you went from having $42 in your check, so I'm sure you're getting money back from your tax accountant to where like, yeah, your business is at a loss, to now, yeah. holy smokes, you, you did really well this year, and, uh, and then this is what you owe in taxes. So do you remember that? Yeah, but you would think that you could write off a loss, but it really wasn't at that time. The part of the struggle was that you owed so much in taxes. Oh. Um, and I think I remember on your podcast, I remember listening to you, I think you had some tax struggles um, oh. when you were building your company, if I remember right. Um, but the problem is, is we really, because we had inventory, it didn't, we weren't taking a loss. We owned that money. And mm. even though it was an inventory, we still had to pay taxes on it. True. So, uh, it wasn't really like we had a write off at that time. We were having to pay a grip in taxes too. So we mm. had to start putting money aside. Luckily we had a good accountant who really helped us through those struggles and would like to take the money from us. We like, we need this money. Nope. <laughs> nope. This is our money. You're putting that in an account. That's not your money. So uh, no. we had a really good account that helped us out with that, those problems. And, uh, and, uh, and so right off the bat, when we got that money, the first thing he made me do was send him a check for that, for that balance that we owed the, the government. He made me send it in. Like, I think within a week I had sent in, I had sent the money to the government already. I'm like, here's that, all that money we got. Here's your check. You know, here's that 300, I think it was like $300,000 or somewhere around there. Yeah. So I paid them their check right away. He may have uh, let me write that in two different checks, but um, I just remember pay making a payment like within a week or two of getting that money straight to the government just so I wouldn't overspend. And, and I had at that time, the, the difference is we had a, um, we, they had also given us a, a credit account 
So we were able to borrow against that. So it was able to um, uh, control those receivables and stuff that we had going on. And we immediately started paying us, paying ourselves like $20,000 a month. So I went from making nothing, what seemed like nothing, to sure. overnight, once we got these guys on board, that we were making you know $20,000 a month at that point. Holy smokes. Uh -huh. So... Dude, I, we are we are like running way over time because you tell so amazing stories. So I got like a couple more like hard hitting questions I want to hit. And then yeah, we got to. I'll try to stay short. Then we'll get, then we'll go into uh, behind the scenes real quick because I got some some good shit I want to ask you. Yes. So, um, dude, the big like like I want to hear about the biggest hurdles that you ran into. If that was like people suing you or money going away or inventory issues, like that, those are some of the stuff that we deal with. So it's like, uh, like what are those things that. Like if you knew that it was going to happen, you're it's, like, it's one of those things where you don't even know, like it becomes where it's not even worth it. Right. Like you get it. You're like, damn, like, is this even worth it? Like what the hell? Like people are suing me for what? Yeah. You know, like that. So like, what, was there anything in the time that you're doing tap out that there were just moments to where you're like, you almost want to put your hands up. Cause it's like, this is stupid. This is not even worth it. Um, you know, uh, taxes always felt like that tax season, you know, but I, I mean, yeah, being sued, man, I, I remember somebody telling me right at the beginning, well, not the beginning, but some, a little ways in sit, telling me, and I didn't even believe them. I thought, you know, how people tell you, give you advice and you always just kind of like file it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. You're somebody who doesn't know what you're talking about, so you don't know. But, um, I had somebody who actually did know what he was talking about. Come tell me a guy I respected, um, a business guy come tell me that, hey, you're not successful until you've been sued. <laughs> I thought, you know, we're always stand-up dudes. Like, we're stand-up guys. And yep. I'm never going to screw anybody. I'm never going to cheat anybody. So I just thought, there's no way I'm ever going to get sued. I just never thought like that. Um, you know, I always my, – my dad is a really, really good dude. And I learned a lot, even though I'm, I wish – you know, I'm, I'm half the man my dad is. Um, I, I always wanted to be – you know, I never wanted to have people angry at me like that. Yeah. I, didn't, I, want, I never wanted to do anybody wrong. And so I would rather take a bad deal than do somebody wrong. You know what I mean? And, uh, and so I just never felt like I'd get sued. It's like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, 10 lawsuits later, you know, it's like, you know, just people, it just, you never think that. And sometimes, and then somebody sues you for something, the stupidest thing. And you're like, I can't even believe I'm being sued right now for this. And I got every, I, we got sued for our logo. We got sued by employees. We got, you know, it was just, it was ridiculous. Sometimes you go, yeah, why are you doing this? You know, you're working so hard yeah. and, uh, and you're, you know, you got money coming in, you're working your ass off. To, and these, and I always just felt like, you know, it's like, I try not to hate as much as, you know, during that time I really had some hate on for people <laughs> and I was just mad that, you know, you try to help people and you're trying to give these people a job and you're trying to, you know, do right by people. And you never felt like, um, I think the people that suit us, um, you know, I, I just, I just feel like they were not in, uh, you know, I'd helped them out. This one guy sued me who I had given a car to, uh, uh, my, I had a 745 and I'd kind of like, uh, a, a nice BMW, you know, it was a little bit older, but it was a nice, it was still nice, beautiful, nice BMW. He really, he came to me one day, he was one of my managers and he came to me and said, Hey, look, you know, I don't have the money to buy it, but you know, maybe I can make monthly payments to you or something. And, uh, and I was like, sure, bro. You know, like I wasn't driving it. It was an extra car in my driveway. And I was like, you know, take it. You know, it was like, I think I was selling it for like 15,000 bucks or 20,000 bucks or something like that. And he was going to give me like 3000 up front and then make payments on the rest of it from his paycheck. And, you know, he made like three payments and then sued me over something stupid. And we ended up having to, to let him go over something. And, uh, and then, you know, it was valid. You're being let go over something. And then now you just stop making payments and you won't give me the car back. You know, because I'd signed the car, trusting him, signed the car over to him and didn't expect him to do what he did wrong. And so now, you know, now I'm not getting paid. And I'm just, and now on top of that, you know, two years later, he sues me. So it just, you know, you just feel like, why are you helping people? Why are you doing all this stuff and trying to make money? And, you know, it'd be so much easier to just go get a regular job. But mm. I just know I wouldn't be happy doing anything else, you know, than what I, what I have the passion for. Yep. I, yeah, I'm, I'm there with you. So, so you get, you get a phone call. I don't know how it worked out, but like, how did you, how did you, how did the people uh, come to you and say, we want to buy tap out? Like how'd that come about? 
Um, well, you know, my partner got killed in 2009. And I think after that, I, you know, we were, I mean, we were best friends for, you know, years, almost 20 years. Um, just all my passion was based around that me and my best friend were building this company. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then also, you know, we had a, another friend too. And so I just, I just lost the food, lost its flavor, man. And I just didn't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like doing it, but I felt like my level, I wasn't running at the same pace anymore. Yeah. I was, I had pulled back and I just wasn't feeling the same. I didn't feel like doing the same level of work because part of what we did was showing each other, you know, it's like that conversation, man, look what I did. And then you yeah. go, man, look what I did. And yeah. man, I got this fighter and, Oh man, you got that fighter. Well, shoot, I got that fighter. You know, we like come over the top of each other, trying to outdo each other all the time. And, uh, and it, we just, I didn't have that anymore. Everything that we did together. Um, you know, we, the, he, when I went out and bought a Lambo, he went out and bought a Ferrari the same day, you know, he ended up getting killed in his Ferrari, unfortunately. And so, but you know, I always, there's, I, everybody asked me, you know, like, were you really like, of course I was sad. But there was some comfort in knowing that my friend had got there. You know what I mean? Yeah. All the things we'd ever talked about, yeah. building the company to this level. And it wasn't so much about money, but money does hold, you know, is it some way to keep score. Um, sure. Building the company to this level to where people would want to invest in you and being on UFC and sponsoring all these fighters and having all this infrastructure and 100 and, you know, 200 employees. Um, you know, being able to buy our dream cars, because uh, we'd always, I'd had this Lamborghini tattoo on here, and I would <laughs> say, one day I'm going to get a Lamborghini, it's going to happen, you know, I was just willing it, I was willing it in my head, I said, it's yeah. going to happen, and him, he was doing the same thing, we'd just talk cars sometimes, man, man, what kind of Ferrari are you going to get, you know, <laughs> man, what color Lamborghini are you going to get, man, you going to get wheels on it, you know, we'd have these full-blown four-hour conversations about cars that we didn't even own yet. And, um, you know, so when that was gone, I just, it just didn't feel the same. You know, I'm sure, you know, you have your brother or somebody like that and you're it's a similar story. Yeah. It? Cops thing, you know, police officer, like it's pretty wild. There's something to that. Maybe, maybe more yeah. police officers to start businesses. Well, cops are notorious for having side businesses. Every yeah. cop I've ever known has got some side business going something on. Something going on. Something going on. So, man, you, you wrote the, you wrote the, you signed off on the contract. The, the deal is signed. It's hands off now what the next day feel like um well actually i stayed on for another five years as president oh, of the company yeah okay. so i didn't leave right away so i just they had their own infrastructure i was more of a figurehead you know it became more of that figurehead piece but you know i mean i had the i mean dude it was the craziest roller coaster ride like i mean there's I, you know i'm a dude from san bernardino who was a police officer and not even at a good police department you know it was like it, and I went from that to, you know, I, I, during that time I had dinner with Jay-Z and Jay-Z was talking about buying our company and, uh, you know, sitting down, I'm sitting down with, I'm dude, I had to like pinch myself and there's, <laughs> and that's just one little, you know, hanging out with all the people I'd ever looked up to or all the people I'd, you know, had grown up thinking about or, you know, sitting, dude, this night with Jay-Z, I was just like, I can't even believe, you know, I'm friends with, I became friends with Tony Robbins, mm. um, you know, all these people, Tony Robbins is the reason, like, I believed in myself to even make this company. I, I bought, I remember buying his tapes when I couldn't afford them <laughs> and, uh, and just watching him on television going, you know, just like, dude, I mean, tears coming down my face. I'm watching <laughs> infomercial because I couldn't even afford to buy his so I'd record his infomercial and just watch his infomercial over and over again just so I could hear his voice and I would just I'm just be like watching the infomercial tears coming down my face and I'm like yeah man I'm gonna do that I'm gonna do that man my daughter I'm doing that for my daughter tears are coming down my face and uh Tony and, has that effect on people I see Tony Robbins you know and I tell my story and we become good friends after that it was like and he actually had me on his infomercial, his next infomercial. Dude, pinch myself. Dude, I'm watch I watched the infomercial to become successful, to become that person. And now he's actually got me on his infomercial. Dude, 
mind fuck, dude. <laughs> mind, you know, I couldn't even I couldn't even comprehend all this stuff. Meeting with Jay Z to talk about our company, and then going to hang, you know, going to this. We, we literally walked, you know, that kitchen. We walked through the kitchen to the club. We do that thing. Um, Ru- uh, Russell, um, Katie, Katie Perry, and Russell, uh, what's his name? Come walking with us, Puffy. All these, you know, we're walking in this elevator. Imagine, dude, I'm in an elevator with Jay Z, Puffy, and that Russell comedian dude, and Katy Perry. Craziness. And then we go upstairs, and uh, and then also um, um, Frederick, the entertainer dude. Yeah. And we're sitting at this uh, booth with Jay Z. I'm I'm literally Jay Z is standing right next to me because he's up addressing the whole club, and uh, and they start freestyle rapping, and him and Puffy, and I'm like right in be- I'm right there, dude. I can't really <laughs> believe it. Just things like that, you know, just things that you just never think in a million years can happen to you. I'm surprised they didn't hand you the mic. Yo, I'm glad they didn't hand me the mic. I, would end, I just had this over, and nothing to say. Nothing would have rhymed for sure. It wouldn't have been, that would have screwed the whole show up. Oh, man. All right, so I want to go back into uh, behind the scenes with you. You've been so amazing. Uh, this has been fantastic, by the way. Probably one of our longest episodes to date. Uh, so I got the two questions I'm going to ask you on the behind the scenes and plus a couple of the three ones hidden. So how Martha Stewart, of all people, uh, made a big impact on your life and the biggest challenge that you're facing uh, today after, after everything's been sold and what you're doing now and things like that, plus, uh, plus three questions. So we're going to hit that. Guys, uh, check out uh, behind the scenes at commercekings.com forward slash VIP. That's commercekings.com forward slash VIP. We'll be back there. Thanks again, man. Um, thanks again, Dan. I appreciate you, brother. Thanks for having me, Trip.